welcome today Professor Philip Kitcher of um, Columbia University, New York, educated here at Cambridge and at Princeton, who, as you know, is an eminent philosopher of science, the author of 10 books, including the 2007 volume, Living with Darwin, Evolution, Design, and the Future of Faith. And he is the editor-in-chief of the journal Philosophy of Science. And he's going to be reflecting in relation to his topic, religion and human nature, what does Darwin teach us? but also responding to our other speakers. Well, thank you very much. I'd also like to thank Pat Bateson and the other organizers for inviting me to participate in this conference, and also especially for inviting them to put me exactly where I am, immediately after Dan Dennett and John Brooke. Since I, my position is intermediate between theirs, um, I think I, I agree with Dan about what doesn't exist, and I agree with John about the complexity of religion, and thereby, it seems to me, hangs a problem. And what I want to do is try to explain that problem. And I'm going to begin with Darwin, and I'm going to begin with the famous modest remark that occurs towards the end of The Origin of Species, where Darwin says, light will hereafter be cast on man and his origins. It's pretty much all Darwin says in The Origin of Species, but of course, many people since then have been inspired to think that they can use Darwinian ideas to understand things about human behavior, human psychology, and human society. This might be thought of as the legacy of the descent of man. And I'm going to suggest to you initially, by way of a methodological point, that we do better to think of the Darwin of the origin of species rather than the Darwin of the descent of man here. Now, many people think that they can do this enterprise in a rather simple and straightforward way, that they can take little bits of human behavior or little bits of human psychology and talk about the way in which natural selection would have acted in some uh, prehistoric environment loosely adapted from the Flintstone series on television. And so, for example, they tell us that since reproduction is essential in the Darwinian world, uh, it would always be a good thing for a lad uh, to look around for extra fertilization opportunities, even if that meant using a little bit of coercion, and to infer from that that um, behind our more or less civilized exteriors, all of us in the room with Y chromosomes have a secret tendency to rape. Uh, now, given the difficulties of understanding natural selection explanations with respect to tractable organisms, whose genetics is well understood, um, whom we can manipulate experimentally that have relatively short generation times and that don't have much in the way of cultural transmission, um, one would think that the, that the difficulties of, of giving evidence for these kinds of accounts would be rather great. And I don't think we are by any means compelled to admit these kinds of vulgar stories. But there is, I think, a better way of learning from Darwin, and it was exemplified by the talk that Sarah Hurdy gave yesterday. And that is to go back to the fundamental method that drives Darwin in The Origin of Species. In that work, Darwin, much a child of his century, thinks about life and contemporary living things as the products of history. He is one of those great 19th century historicists like Hegel and many others, but he is unlike them in having, as it were, given the cash for the historicist method. He actually showed the world how you could understand all sorts of important things about a particular phenomenon, in this case life, as products of a historical series of processes. Now, I think that that historicist method can be applied and applied responsibly to human society, human behavior, human psychology, human institutions. And that involves a great deal of synthetic work of the kind that Darwin did so beautifully in The Origin of Species. It means drawing on a range of disciplines, not just on simple-minded ideas about the operation of natural selection, but from history, sociology, anthropology, comparative biology, archaeology, psychology, the study of cultural change. All of these things can have inputs into a sophisticated account of various kinds of human institutions, human forms of behavior, like, for example, the care of young, about which Sarah Hurdy told us yesterday. Now, I want to take this in the direction of our topic this morning, 
by thinking about religion and ethics in tandem. And so in doing so, I will try to echo some things that John Brooke emphasized. I want to think of something I'm going to call the ethical project. The ethical project is a human invention. It isn't just the expression of whatever pro-social devices we had as a residue of a chimpanzee-like past or a hominid-like past, augmented in the ways of maternal care and cooperative maternal care, parental care. It isn't just the expression of those tendencies. It's the social endorsement of some forms of behavior and the social rejection of other forms of behavior. And this, it seems to me, was an amplifier that increased human cooperation in the past. I don't have time to give you the evidence for why I think this today. I've only got probably now about five and a half minutes. Uh, so I can't give you much in the way of evidence. But I invite you to think about it as a hypothesis, that in small bands, perhaps 50,000 years ago, perhaps 75,000 years ago, perhaps 40,000 years ago, I really don't know, a group got together and on more or less equal terms decided on some useful rules for governing their shared lives together. And that was the beginning of normatively guided human life. It flowered in all sorts of ways. And the cultural experiments that were begun by those little bands many, many thousands of years ago have, I believe, led by the sort of process akin to the diagram Darwin gives in The Origin to the kinds of ethical systems we have today. Now, how does this connect with matters of religion? I think in all sorts of ways. I think we're inclined to treat religion too, uh, too much as a, in, in terms of essentialism as a kind of blockish thing. But I think of religions as composed of all sorts of multidimensional things, rituals, forms of behavior, uh, attitudes of all kinds, and not just beliefs. And one way I think that religious ideas intervened at a relatively early stage, probably in the ethical project, was in terms of helping to promote human compliance with the rules of the group. If you think about it, groups that want to register norms and live by those norms have a problem. There aren't always people around to observe when people break the rules. What better then than a being or a force or an entity of some sort to which all things are public so that there is no privacy anymore? Everything is known. This idea is prevalent in a very wide range of cultural traditions. This was already obvious to the great anthropologist, Darwinian anthropologist Westermark, a uh, hundred years ago when he wrote a chapter in his great book on the evolution of moral systems on gods as guardians of morality. This is, in one way, a rather progressive step since cultures that adopt this idea of a transcendental policeman forever watching may be expected to get greater compliance with the norms that they introduce. But it is also, in its way, a regressive step because it paves the way for forms of moral rule giving that are no longer geared to the well-being of the group, to discussions among the group. And it does that through the possibility of experts, people who claim and whose claims are acknowledged that they can have access to the will of this being. They know what this being wants. And that means that, that, that there can enter into the ethical project all kinds of distortions and idiosyncrasies, concepts of sin that are grounded in things that have nothing to do with the collective good of the group or with the good of any individual. Now this, I think, is very much typical of the history of those cultures, those very motley and patchwork cultures we call religions. They are, in general, driven by forces that do not tend in any way to promote truth. And this is why I agree with Dan. The forces that shape religion have nothing to do with sophisticated understanding of the world in which we live or justified acceptance of spirits or ancestors or gods or sacred spaces or whatever the favorite transcendental item in the religion is. So I think we have no reason to believe the factual doctrines 
put forward by these various traditions. But those traditions produce ideas that interweave themselves with our normative lives, that give shape to human lives in various ways. And here John Brook was very eloquent on the varied ways in which religions serve as sources of solace, comfort, hope, they sustain social movements. Besides the darkness of the distortions introduced in the ethical project by ideas of sin, by condemnation of particular individuals, say, who want to sleep with members of their own sex, there are also the moments at which the religious doctrine serves as a force in the direction of social justice, serves in the direction of greater equality. And so I think, and this is the problem that we face today, that there's a real challenge for contemporary society. We have to come to terms with the fact that these various traditions, with their inconsistent bodies of doctrine, are all evolving in the same way, none more likely to be true than any other, and thus all profoundly likely to be radically false. And yet we have to, do, to deal with the fact that they are interwoven with human lives. And I don't know how to do this, but I want to conclude by echoing something that John Sulston said yesterday. I think there is a difficulty in continuing the ethical project today. And in part, it's because of the distortions produced by religion, by the ways in which religions have imposed upon us rather arbitrary categories of sin and wickedness. But there are other distortions that have come about as the result of the fact that we live in societies of far greater size. We have to get back, I think, to the more simple and straightforward egalitarianism that I think must have marked the beginnings of the ethical project. And so I want to echo John Sulston's call for global justice. This is a real challenge for us today, how to continue this project in a world that has become very much more hierarchical, a world of haves and have-nots, and a world that is also fractionated by the doctrines of the different religions. So I want to see, if you like, an alliance between those forms of religion that go beyond literalism about the supernatural and a genuinely secular humanism that places equal emphasis on the humanism and on the secularity. Thank you.